teach my people faith. That's the charge which has compelled Kenneth E. Hagan for more than 55 years of ministry. Kenneth Hagan has established his life and ministry on the simple truths of unchanging integrity of God's Word. From streets, tents, churches, and auditoriums, the locations have changed, but the message remains the same. The impact of Kenneth Hagan Ministries is felt around the world through books, tapes, daily radio broadcasts, and the Rama Bible Training Center. Beginning with only 58 graduates in 1975, Rama Bible Training Center has grown to occupy a beautiful campus near Tulsa, Oklahoma, and now has graduates on every inhabited continent of the globe. Rama offers a two-year curriculum designed to prepare men and women of all ages to fulfill God's call on their lives. We're going to read the same scripture tonight that we read the last two nights. First of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world, there is a God of this world, called Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Then in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 10 through 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now we're speaking to you along this line, or this thought, what to do when faith seems weak and victory seems lost. And I guess all of us have been there. If you haven't, well, just hold on. You'll get there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, the number one thing to do is to recognize, and we covered that the first night, recognize the source of the opposition as being Satan and stand your ground. Amen. Hallelujah. Having done all the scripture said to stand, stand. And then number two, the second step to take is be sure that the promises of God, that is the scriptures, covers the thing that you ask for, the things that you ask for, and are believing for. You see, faith, Bible faith, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about faith is Bible faith. Now, some people in false cults and one thing or another, they say the same thing, but they mean something else. Those in the mind science religions are talking about you having faith in your own mentality, your own mind. They say mind is God and God is mind, so your mind is God. That's not what I'm talking about. Some people talk about having faith in yourself. And of course, in the world, in the natural, from a certain standpoint, you have to believe that you can do certain things. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Bible faith that's based on what God said the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 said, So then faith cometh. This kind of faith, this Bible faith, cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now the trouble with a lot of folks in their believing, the reason they're defeated, is they're trying to believe beyond the Word. Well, you can't do that. I've said for over 50 years, and I'm not going to quit now because it's true. Find scriptures that promise you the things you're praying for. 
Amen. You've got a solid foundation for faith then. I ran a little survey. I left the last church I pastored in 1949, from 1949 through 1962, for 13 years, I was in churches. The Lord said to me, stay in the church, holding meetings in churches. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, I ran a little poll or survey on that 13-year period. Folks didn't know what I was doing, but I asked them. Those that would come to me after morning teaching classes. And Brother Hagin, I want you to pray for me. Well, I said, what for? Sometimes they'd say, well, do I have to tell you? I said, yeah, I'm not going to pray unless you do. There's no use of praying unless you know what it is. Because folks expect one of two things of you. They either, number one, expect you to have faith for whatever it is. And you can't believe for something when you don't know what it is. Uh, or secondly, they, ask, they want you to agree with them. And you can't agree on something when you don't know what it is. And so that's the reason that victory is lost so many times. There's so much lost motion in what we're doing. Amen. Somebody said, I've got an unspoken request. I want you to pray about it. Well, you can't pray about an unspoken request. Or oh, somebody said, well, God knows. Well, if he already knows anyways, no use me telling him. <laughs> Amen. That's just lost motion. Waste of time. Amen. Amen. No, thank God we can believe in line with God's word. Yes. If God's word said it, amen, that it's mine, then it's mine. Yes. Praise God. I don't know about you, but I, I, I get a little perturbed sometimes with these folks always coming up with some kind of new revelation. You know, we've got to get something new. But I don't know about you, but I don't think anybody's going to get anything new. Uh, amen. Unless you go outside the Bible, the Bible's been there all the time. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, well, you know, Brother Hagin got this revelation of faith. No, I didn't. It's in the Bible all the time. <laughs> Praise God. And, and, and you know, this faith movement's something new. No, it isn't. Not a thing in the world new. Amen. I remember one of the founders of the Assemblies of God movement set in mind, a, a man, you know, near 80, a number of years ago, and he heard me teach 20 lessons on the subject of faith. And he said to me, Brother Hagin, you know, some folks said, well, you know, that's not scripture. He said, well, when in, in the beginning of our movement, that's, that's the way we preach it. All of us preach like that. Hallelujah. So it's not new. Amen. Amen. I said, it's not new. Somebody said, a new wave is coming. Get on a new wave. Did you ever stop to think about that that new wave is the same water that's been coming in all the time? <laughs> Amen. It's a new wave, but the same water. Don't change water. Praise God. God just puts the emphasis on something else, you know, that needs to be emphasized at the moment. Amen. You know what he's putting his emphasis on right now? Number one, the local church. He wants to build strong local churches. There's been so much that went away from the church and led people away from the church. Are you listening to me? Amen. But I want to tell you a little secret. I know. You say, how do you know? I'll tell you how I know. Because Jesus told me. Amen. Amen. I had a divine visitation from heaven a little over a year ago just before camp meeting. I never have told all of it yet. It's not time to tell it all. But, but let me say this. Jesus said this. The Holy Ghost will never, can never manifest himself in an auditorium meeting like he wants to and will manifest himself in the local church. Amen. Amen. So therefore, no, and he'll never manifest himself on television like he will manifest himself in the local church. And so if we don't have strong local churches, we're going to miss the real manifestations of the Holy Ghost because the auditorium meetings, and don't misunderstand me, they have their place, but they're primarily based on whatever manifestation of the Spirit that individual has and too many times upon the personality of the individual. And that's the reason they come to naught. Amen? And so it's the same way with the television program. But I tell you, that body of believers, and that's the reason he's building, he wants to build strong local churches. Hallelujah. Paul writing to the church at Corinth, you know, in 1 Corinthians, uh, and we read it, you know, in the third chapter, first of all, and then the sixth chapter. But in the third chapter, the 16th verse, King James translation said, Know ye not that, writing to the church at Corinth, that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost? The Amplified translation said, Do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, 
are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you to be at home in you. Now listen, to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. Did you get that? Did you get that? And you see that local body of believers. Well, don't we have church when all of us come together in a great meeting? Yeah, but it's not the same. We're coming from different groups. We're coming from different levels. Are you listening to me? Impossible to get into one accord, one spirit like you should. But you see, all you've got there is the manifestation or the anointing of the Holy Ghost, singularly the anointing, usually the anointing that's upon the one that's ministering. But when that body of believers come together, there's a corporate anointing. Hallelujah. And that anointing's much stronger than the individual anointing. And there's something about the Holy Ghost that this modern generation is not going to know unless some of us that do know tell it. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Are you listening to me now? Amen. And so thank God for that. No, folks are looking for something new. Well, thank God the Word of God's ever new. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And we need folks that are steadfast and sure to stand on God's Word and preach the Word of God. Folks go around, you know, sometimes they ask me, Brother Hagin, what's God doing now? I said, everything he's always done. He hadn't changed a bit. He never changes. God never changes. God never changes. Well, what new thing is he about to do? I said, nothing. Amen. God's interested, number one, and you ought to be too, in winning the lost. But you see, you've got these little groups. They all gather together. All they're interested in is devils and demons and so on and so forth. And you get another group and all they're interested in is prayer. All of that's important in its place unless you overly emphasize it and get off on the, in the ditch. Are you listening to me? But the number one priority is take the gospel to the world. Amen. Amen. And that's what Jesus is waiting for in these last days. James, you know, 5, 7, James said, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Well, blessed be God, we're looking forward to the coming of the Lord. He said he was coming. The Bible says he's coming. The angel says he's coming. Paul preached that he's coming. Peter preached that he's coming. James preached that he's coming. Jude preached that he's coming. Hallelujah. Is he coming? The Bible said so. Well, why don't he come? Why don't he come? James 5, 7 said, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth. What's he waiting on? Till we get all the demons cast out of everybody? No, 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 no. Everybody don't have a demon in them anyway. Amen. These folks running around hollering, everybody's got devils in them. I just soon hear a donkey bray at midnight in a tin barn. I've got more respect for the donkey because the poor old donkey, that's all he knows to do is bray. But those stupid folks ought to know better than just be a brain all the time. Amen. No, 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 no. What's he waiting on? Till we all get perfect? No, because you never will be perfect long as you're in that body. Amen. I said amen. You never will be perfect. Only perfect person ever lived on this earth was Jesus and they killed him. If you ever get perfect, you won't last long either. Amen. No, he's not waiting for the church to get perfect. Why don't he come? Why don't he come? Is he waiting till everybody's baptized in water according to my method? No. What's he waiting on? Until everybody joins my church? No. He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. He's waiting for a harvest. And that just delights the devil for Christians to get to fighting one another and get off on this tangent and get off on that tangent and get off on something else and the world's going to hell. Oh, blessed be God. Let's get our priorities right. And that's one reason that folks are defeated. Amen. Because they're living on the wrong side of the track. Bless God. Let's get, let's get things straight. Amen. Amen. Praise God forevermore. You see, you have a right to believe for anything that's in the Word or that the Word of God promises you. But if you go out beyond what the Word of God says, then you're out on presumption and foolishness. The Word of God is the foundation for our faith. Now the psalmist of old said in the 119th Psalm, the 130th verse, the entrance of thy words giveth light. 
the entrance of God's Word giveth light. When there is light in a room, you know as well as I do, there's no problem at all to walk around in that room because it's full of light. But when the lights are out and it's dark in the room, you may stumble and fall over objects that's in that room because you can't see. As long as the light's there, you can walk fine. Well, the entrance of his words giveth light. Hallelujah. The reason that many fall and fail is because they've left the light of the word. They're walking in presumption and folly. So really they're walking in darkness. What does God's word say? Too many times folks said, well, I don't know. Uh, well, find out what it said. Like I said to you earlier, remember I'll come back to it now. I asked people, I ran a poll for 13 years. People would say to me, pray for me. Well, what for? Do I have to tell you? Well, I'm not going to pray unless you do because you either expect me to believe or to agree. If I don't know what it is, I can't agree. So what is it? They tell me their particular petition they want me to pray for. I've said to them many, many times, if you, if you multiply it over the years, you understand it would be hundreds of times. And, and, and I've said to them, what scriptures are you standing on, brother or sister, whichever the case? And eight times out of 10, I kept a record of it, eight times out of 10, eight people out of 10 said to me, not any in particular. I said, that's what you'll get, so nothing in particular. <laughs> Amen. Find the scripture, walk in the light. See, they're not walking in the light. They're sort of in a gray area, in semi-darkness. Hallelujah. Praise God. When you get away from the scriptures, you're in a gray area. Some people want to step over into the dark, whether or not the word of God promise it or not. I've had them to say, well, I'm just going to believe God anyhow. No, you're not. You're in the dark. Amen. Amen. Believing God is believing his word how necessary it is to know the Word of God. Thank God he's given us his Word. We need not be in the dark. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Now what does it mean to walk in the light? It means to walk in the Word. It means to walk in the Word. Walking in the Word is walking in the light. To walk away from the Word means to walk in darkness. Hallelujah. Well, I want you to say it out loud. Now, I am a believer. I'm not a doubter. I do have faith. My faith works. My faith is in God the Father. My faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. My faith is in the Holy Bible, the Word of God. God's Word is true. I believe the Word of God. Therefore, I believe God. God's Word works. Hallelujah. Now then, here's another thought. What to do when faith seems weak and victory seems lost? Well, number three, be sure that you're not living in sin. Practicing wrongdoing. Notice what James 1, or 1 John 1, 7 said. You're familiar with it? If we walk in the light as he's in the light. Amen. Amen. The entrance of thy words giveth light. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, what does it mean to walk in the light? It means to walk in the Word. As long as you walk in what light you have, there is an automatic cleansing from all sin of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you persist in living in wrongdoing, you're going to get into trouble sooner or later. Your faith will not work. Your prayers will not work. Amen. Amen. Jesus spoke great words on the subject of faith. We're familiar with them. Look into the 11th chapter of Mark. 23rd verse, whosoever shall say 
unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things ever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. And thank God for those verses. But that's not all he said on the subject. That's not all of it. He immediately went right on and said, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have all against any, any. You see, sin is a hindrance to faith. Amen. Forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. The 25th verse. See, he was talking about a hindrance to faith, a hindrance to prayer. He's talking about faith. For he said, you know there in the 22nd verse, how faith in God, or the King James said, the martyr said, have the faith of God. And he went on then to define or describe the faith of God for whosoever shall say, under this mountain be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. That those things which he says shall come to pass, and I want to serve he said, therefore, I say unto you what things ever you desire when you pray. Everybody say pray. pray. So you see, he's talking about faith and prayer, isn't he? Faith and prayer. And now then he comes up with this hindrance. For unforgiveness is a hindrance to faith. Unforgiveness is a hindrance to prayer. I've said for a good many years, because I've, I, went, I, I encourage folks to do this, you go through the New Testament, particularly the four gospels, Underline with a red pencil everything Jesus said relative to faith. Or better yet, take your sheet of paper and write all the verses down. I've done that. I've sought them out very carefully. And you'll find this is the only hindrance he ever mentioned. Now, that doesn't mean there are not other hindrances. But what does that mean? That means that he warned us, he's faithful to warn us where the greatest danger is. Amen? Amen. I said, amen. amen. And you know, of course, we all know everybody, and you go to thinking about sin, well, people go to thinking about, you know, uh, uh, lying, stealing, murder, adultery, sins of the flesh, but they've forgotten that unforgiveness is a sin. Amen. amen. And there's no use of getting into discussion of which sin is worse or which sin is bad or, or this is worse than that. If it's sin, it's sin. Amen. And if it's sin, we don't have any business with it. Little or big, or middle size, or any size. Amen. If there's an air of unforgiveness about you, your faith won't work, your prayers won't work. Jesus said so right here. If my faith and my prayers are not working, this would be the first place I'd look. I've been saying that for many, many years. I never permit, and will never permit, the least bit of ill will, hard feelings in my heart against anybody. I absolutely refuse to do it. Now, of course, the devil will suggest things to your head. Listen to me real carefully now. Because, see, I don't want you to be defeated. And here's what defeats a lot of people. The devil will suggest things to your head, but you're not walking by your head. I'm talking about in this spiritual walk. Sure, in the natural, a lot of times, you've got to walk by your head. If you start to cross the street and see a car coming, you better believe what you see and stop. We may all have some place to go. Your funeral. Amen. <laughs> No, I'm talking about, you, you, you see, the devil suggests saying to your head, but you're not walking by head, your head. Now, why? Because faith is not of, the, not of the head. Notice the text said, and shall not doubt in his heart. Never said a word about doubting in his head. Jesus said, and shall not doubt in his heart. Thoughts may come. Listen to me carefully, and the word of God will teach you. The entrance of his words giveth life will teach you how to deal with thought. Thoughts may come, and they may persist in staying. But thoughts that are not put into words or into action die unborn. Amen? Amen? Now you need to know that because you see the devil endeavors to defeat you and he endeavors to put thoughts in your mind and then he'll tell you if you were saved you'd never thought such a thing as that and you really didn't think it anyway. It came to you from an outside source. Because see, Satan is the God of this world. And you contact this world with your mind and with your physical senses, don't you? Amen. 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 Let me say it again. Thoughts may come. Thoughts may persist. But thoughts that are not put into words or into action die unborn. 
Hallelujah. Don't put them into words and don't put them into action. Hallelujah. I tell the story sometimes. It's a true story about an evangelist holding me a meeting. And he did some things that were wrong toward me and my church. I'm not going to talk about it, but you'd know it right away. But you know what the Bible says? I, I, and the devil suggested to me, if I was you, wouldn't take him up another offering. You'd have to take one up the last night, you know. But then don't try to get him anything. Well, uh, you know, the Bible teaches us, according to Matthew 5, to return good for evil. I knew that thought. That thought came to my mind. I didn't think it up. It didn't come up out of my spirit. It came from out here somewhere into my mind. I wouldn't try to get him anything. Acted like he acted, done you like he's done you. I said, just for that, Mr. Devil, I'm taking him an offering up every night. Amen. 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 And if you say anything else about it, I'm going to take him up two offerings every night. Well, I'll tell you, the thought never occurred anymore. Devil never brought in more thought. He don't want any preachers to get two offerings a night. <laughs> Amen. He don't even want them to get one, but certainly not two. And then I asked him, because my church wasn't just a little bitty church. It's what, it was what we called a medium-sized church. And he preached more in the big churches than he did the medium-sized. And so I asked him, what do you average? What's your average income? Offerings. He told me. I gave him three times as much as he got from the big churches and put two-thirds of it in out of my own pocket. Amen. Bible said, return good for evil. Yeah. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise his holy name forevermore. Well, you see, our problem is that we live so in the natural because we are living in this physical body. And we have to live in the natural world. But we get oriented to the natural. We're so in the natural. And, and so when we, because of that, when we think of sin, like I said, we, we think about maybe sins of the flesh. We think about maybe robbing a bank, committing adultery, Murder, lying, stealing. We think, oh, isn't that terrible? And it is. But did you know you need to know this? If it's true, you need to know it. And I'll tell you where I found it out. I found out because Jesus told me in one of the visions when he appeared to me. He's talking along this line. And he said to me, I'll judge the believer quicker on spiritual sins than I will physical sins. Now, you see, that almost goes blank because your mind goes blank. You don't know what spiritual sins are. Amen. Well, when he said that, it shocked me. But you see, a lot of times you get by for a little while on physical sin, but sooner or later you'll get judged. God will judge you sooner or later, but he'll judge you quicker on spiritual sins. Now, what do you mean? Well, you see, you can see if somebody, if you happen to be there when he robbed the bank, you saw him, or... You, you, you read the story about it. You know he did. You were there maybe, or else you know about some fella lying or stealing. You can see that. It reads it on your physical senses. But you see, uh, you can't see the attitude of someone's heart. But God can. I said God can. That's what I'm talking about. That's a spiritual sin. See, you can do the right thing on the outside when on the inside, oh, brother. Amen. I mean, you can, you can preach a sermon, beautiful sermon, get great results. People get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, heal, and thank God for that. But you can have the wrong attitude. You can say, boy, look at me, I did it. Mm -hmm. Oh, you watch, listen to me. Your motives can be all wrong. Your motives can be all wrong. Sure, it's right to preach. Sure, it's right to believe God for our finances. Sure, God wants to prosper us. But your main motive can be just to get money. And that's all wrong. I get so aggravated at these folks nowadays, you know. Amen. You can do what you want to, but I've never asked anybody for a dime yet. Make demands. Some of these traveling preachers make demands supposed to be faith people, making demands on the church. Well, how much are you going to pay me? They're not going there to get souls and bless people. They're going there to get money. They better change their motives. They're going to get judged real quick now. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I'm concerned about helping people. I'm concerned about blessing folks. I'm concerned about 
blessing them. And I believe if I'll feed them, they'll feed me. Amen. 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 But I'll tell you the truth about the matter, if you'll just listen a little bit, if you've got good sense and will listen, listen a little bit, you listen to radio programs and television programs and there's mighty little fo food, mighty little food going out. All they're doing is begging for money so much of the time. Begging for money, begging for money, begging for money, begging money. If you'll feed people, they'll feed you. Amen. I've always believed that. Amen, it always worked. Amen. I held, I know here's Brother Bob Nichols here tonight from Fort Worth. I don't know how many meetings I held for him. Lost count of them, so many of them, I guess. Amen. I, I, I preached in the first church that he started. He, he, he leased a, a, a post office that they had a building, that they, a sub post office they had abandoned. He put some chairs in there and just put some plyboard up on some, uh, up on some uh, cement blocks. And I tell you, you know, you know this way, that thing would just tilt on you almost, wouldn't it? I mean, it's just, and, and I went to hold him meeting. But he'll tell you, I never asked him for a dime. I never said, how much are you going to pay me? I've got to have so much. I never mentioned money. I'm not there for money. I expect God to meet my need. I'm there to bless him. I'm there to bless his wife. I'm there to bless his people. I'm there to be a blessing. Amen. That should be our attitude. That should be our commitment. Amen. When you do that, when you put first things first, the Bible said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his right, and all of these other things will be added. They won't be taken away from you. They'll be added unto you. They'll be added unto you. Amen. 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 I remember in the days of Voice of Healing, an evangelist, it was an evangelist with us in the Voice of Healing. And I was teaching, preaching in a certain church, and he stopped by and was in the morning service. After the morning teaching class, he and I and the pastor were talking. And you've got to realize now that I'm talking about 36 years ago. I'm talking about 36 years ago this month of April, right now, this month of April, 36 years ago. And you've got to realize that in those days, we're talking about preaching in the full gospel churches, Pentecostal churches. And if we had a half a dozen saved and three or four filled with the Holy Ghost, we thought we had a landslide in two or three weeks meeting. Amen. But we got the report, this fellow went and preached it on a full gospel church, just in a church. And he just preached Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night, and it just went everywhere because it was unheard of. Fifty people got saved in that, little, in that church on Saturday night. Boy, we're all thrilled about that. Now, there he is in our meeting, and so me, he and I and the pastor are talking after the service. Everybody left, just us three. And, and, and so the pastor brought up the subject, said, we heard about that meeting Saturday night. Fifty folks. You know, unheard of in those days. Responded to that, you know, altar call and was, was, was saved. And I remember this fellow reached out and got a hold of pastor's tie and sort of did it like, yeah, yeah, he said, I'll tell you, boy. I'll tell you, boy. I'll tell you something. He said, if I can't get them, nobody can. In other words, I got them. I didn't say a word. I made a note of that. Amen. I made a note of that. Said, you write it down? No, up here. Amen. And I make notes of things I don't ever forget them. You know that if you've been around very long. <laughs> Amen. I made a note of that because I know pride goeth before destruction. I know the wrong attitude. Amen. I watched him from that moment. Down, 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 down. Thank God for people getting saved. That's one reason I'll never let. I never let once in a while Ken to slip up on me and I don't like for him to. I never let anybody introduce me. Somebody say something about Brother Hagin is a great man of faith. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I just have faith in a great God. Amen. I just have faith in a great God. I feel actually sometimes like I've done the least of anybody. Almost ashamed to get out in public sometime. Amen, but I want to do more. Yes. Forgetting the things that are behind, I press forward towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Having done all. We'll just have to say we're unprofitable servants. Thank God he's able to work to us if we'll be humble and do our best to yield to him. Can you say amen? amen. But don't take credit unto yourself. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. So people can act on the outside, but things are different on the inside, but God can see the inside. People may be like the little boy, you know. He was naughty at school and the teacher made him stand up in the corner. And he said to somebody nearby, well, I'm standing up on the outside, but I'm sitting down on the inside. 
God can see when you're sitting down on the inside. Amen. 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 Now, we need, we need balance, however, in self-examination. There's a need for balance in this area, just like there's a need for balance in every area of the Scripture. Don't get in the ditch here on, on the one side or the other. Some people let the devil constantly harass them about wrongdoing, about past mistakes, past failures, past sins. They let the devil rob them because the devil will bring the thought or the picture of it to them and keep them thinking on it and it'll rob them of their faith. It'll rob them of their healing. It'll rob them of the blessings that God intended that they should have. Now, if we look back, but you know, I can't find in the scriptures anywhere where God tells us to look back. If we look back, I'm sure of this, we can all see where we missed it. I mean, even when we thought we were doing real good. Like somebody said, hindsight's better than foresight. I know I passed it. You see, 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 at the moment when we lived it, we thought we did pretty well. I passed it for 12 years, more than one church. It was sort of custom at first when I came over in Pentecostal ranks that just about everybody changed church every year. You didn't stay over two years in one church. Some of you folks can remember that, Pentecostal circles. Well, you know, sometimes, you know, I passed, I thought, boy, you, man, man, I left thinking I did a jam up job. <laughs> boy, yes, sir, yes, sir. But I grew a little bit spiritually and I looked back and I got so embarrassed, I'd never even go back there to visit anymore as a shame. <laughs> I did such a poor job. I repented and asked God to forgive me. Amen. Amen. And I'm sure of this one thing, I'm certainly true, as we look back, we can allow the devil to defeat us. Amen. I was holding a revival meeting in a church one time. And a businessman in that church, he wanted, well, I'd laid hands on him several times. This was in the days of the healing revival. They were, they were, I guess every Healy evangelist in America had laid hands on him. All the big boys as well as us little boys. And I had a better chance than the big boys did. They just laid hands on him once. I laid hands on him three times. He's still not healed. So he wanted to talk to me. Finally, I said, well, all right, you come, I'll come 30 minutes early. I had a teaching service at daytime, but he is in his business, owned his own business. He was in business, wasn't there in the daytime. I didn't talk to people after church at night. And so I said, you come early tomorrow night. I'll come early, meet you in the pastor's study about 30 minutes before church and talk to you. So I came. Well, actually, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready to go to church. And so as I'm getting ready to go to church, you know, I started to put my trousers on. And I got this leg in the trousers and about to put the other one. It's just like somebody standing in the room said, do you think that I would require something of you that I wouldn't be willing to do? Well, I stopped dead still right there. Because, and I recognized that was the Lord. I mean, just as real to me as though somebody standing in the room talking to me. And I said, no, I know, Lord, you wouldn't do that. That'd be wrong. You'd be unjust. And so I went ahead and put my trousers on, got my shirt on. I'm tying my tie. And again, I heard these words, just like some man standing in the room talking to him. as a man's voice said, do you think I would require something of you that I wouldn't be willing to do myself? I said, why no, Lord, wouldn't be right. I went ahead getting ready, put on my coat, started out the door, and the third time I heard it. Do you think I would require you to do something that I wouldn't be willing to do? I said, no, Lord, you wouldn't do that. That would be, you'd be unjust. I got in the car and headed toward the church. I'm driving down the street, and as I'm driving down the street, it's like somebody sitting in the back seat, nobody in the car but me but just like somebody sat in the back seat said, do you think I would require something of you or you to do something that I wouldn't be willing to do? I said, no, Lord, you wouldn't do that. If you did, you'd be unjust. And you're not unjust. And then he quoted this scripture to me. I knew it. It's in his sick among them called for the elders of the church that them pray on him and anoint the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith to save the sick. That means heal the sick. We usually stop right there. You know, that's not all that. He emphasized this. And if they've committed sins, he didn't say sin, sins, plural. If they've committed sins, they shall be forgiven them. And then he said, 
Peter came to me one day and said, how often should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Till seven times? And Jesus said, not, I say not unto thee till seven times, but till seven times 70. How many is seven times 70? 490 times. Now you, that's in Matthew 18. You put that together, what he said in Luke, and that's all in one day. Well, he said, if I require you to forgive your brother for sinning, you know, if he repents, of course, if he doesn't repent, you think I wouldn't forgive you? It says, and their sins shall be forgiven. Well, about that time I got to church, I wondered, what in the world is he trying to tell me something? You know, I thought, I don't need it, but you see, somebody else did. I got in the office, and immediately this man began to speak. He, he talked, he's, I think, 56, 57 years old, but he was, something like that. 57, I think. And he said, uh, and he'd been a Christian 35 years. And, and as he began to talk, he told me how many people prayed for him, every healing meeting. I'd prayed for him. I'd laid hands on him three times. And he never had got healing. He had a condition. The doctors wanted him to sell his business. They said, you stay in business, you're liable to fall dead any time. Because he had a kidney trouble. It, it, affected his, uh, it affected his heart and his high blood pressure. They said, you could fall dead any minute. Now sell your business and just lay around, lie around and rest and stay on this medication and you might live another two years. But he said uh, he, he didn't want to sell his business. He he'd tried to get some offers on it, but it, right at the time, this in his area, they're a little depressed. He couldn't really get out of what it was worth. Uh, and, and, but, but then he said he was just sure the Lord wouldn't heal him. I said, why? Well, I missed it in so many ways. I've been saved 35 years and I've just sinned, and I've just come so far short. Well, I said, what awful sins have you committed? How many banks have you robbed? How many folks have you killed? How many times have you committed adultery? He said, not any. I said, how, uh, uh, how many lies have you told? He said, not any. No, he said, I'm not talking about the sin of commission. He said, it's a sin of omission. And you know, that's something else we need to learn? Amen. That there's sins of omission as well as commission? The Bible said to him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not to him, it's sin. You omit to do it, it's sin. Are you listening? See, his were sins of omission. And he said, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've paid my tithes most of the time. Not, not always have I been faithful like I should. But, but I'm in business, I have money. I could have given more money to missions. I could have prayed more. I could have been more faithful. I, I could have witnessed to people you know more. I've just failed so many ways. As he was talking, I began to think about it. I began to see then why the Lord had showed me. So I showed him these scriptures. I said, well, now you've missed it. How many times? Have you missed it 490 times? Every day for the last 35 years? Why, dear Lord, no. He said, I haven't missed it 490 times in 35 years. I said, you've got a good margin to operate on then. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, now, why didn't his faith work? Because he's looking back and he's letting the devil bring his past mistakes and his failures, amen, to him and harass him. But you see, just as soon as he saw the truth, standing there in the pastor's study, pastor's office, I laid my hands on him. Thank God I said to him, well, You've asked the Lord to forgive you, heaven, of all your past mistakes and failures. He said, he certainly has. I said, they don't exist then. They're all gone. Right. Don't think about them. All the devil did was brought you a photo or a picture of them. From now on, you tell him, yeah, that's right, devil. But I asked the Lord to forgive me, and he's forgiven me, and all you've got is a picture. They don't really exist. I laid hands on him, and you know, thank God, he was healed. Years later, when he was about 20 years later, he'd be 77 then, almost 80. I was preaching in that area, and in preaching on the, in that area, uh, someone came and, and, and mentioned him to me from that other church see, where I preached. Mr. So-and-so, remember he is healed, you know, because he'd testify about being healed in my meeting. Yeah? Well, it said he just retired the other day. Went right on, you see. And, and, and he sold his business finally after another 20 years when he's 77 and retired, still in good health. But you see, he could have lost the victory. Amen. Amen, could have even died by letting the devil harass him. Amen. 
Now you understand this, on the other hand, on the other hand, if you persist and continue to practice sin and wrongdoing, you're going to get into trouble. If you don't judge yourself, sooner or later, you will have to be judged. God, sooner or later, will judge you. Now, you remember 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one said, for if we would judge yourself, we should not be judged. If we would judge yourself. What do you mean? How do you judge yourself? Well, if we do wrong, face up to it. Amen. That's wrong. I judge that. I'm going to put that away and not do it anymore. We judge ourselves and refuse to practice or to live in sin anymore. That's what I mean. Oh, thank God for the grace of God. I don't know whether any of us have really plumbed the depth of his grace yet, but thank God for his grace. I remember reading uh, after D.L. Moody, he said he was sitting in his study there in Chicago getting ready for his Sunday sermon, and he was studying on the subject of grace. And he got so overwhelmed that without thinking, he jumped up, ran down the street, and the first person he's met, he said, do you know grace? <laughs> Amen. Grace who? They said, the grace of God. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've seen such manifestations of God's grace until it overwhelmed me. I went away weeping. I remember an older man in the town which we lived in Texas. He was only about 66 and a half, 67 years old. He wanted me to come pray for him. Well, I went by to pray for him. Uh, and, and, and I couldn't say the word healing. I never had an experience before that like in my life. I have since then. But up to then, I never had. I, I was thinking that. I was trying to pray healing. My tongue would say something else. Finally, I'm just lumping it all together. Finally, I said to the Lord, Lord, why can't I pray for this man's healing? You see, the doctors had given him up. They said he may be dead in, in, se in seven minutes. He could be dead in seven hours. He might die in seven days. But I guarantee you one thing, he'll never live seven months. Uh, but I can't pray for his healing. And, and, and so I'm, I'm praying in English all the time, standing there by my bed with his hand on, my hand on his head, and I can't say the word healing. And so I keep praying with, with my mind a prayer, and I took my hand off his head, and, 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 and on the inside of me in my spirit, because you see, God's in here. Amen. 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 I said, God's in here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a statement like that. See, now you make a statement like that, then people in me to bless their darling hearts and stupid head, they're either ignorant or dishonest. They'll say, well, now he's like those folks. See, there are people in the world without God. They say, everybody's got God in them. There's a spark of divinity in all of it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what 2 Corinthians 6, 16 said. Amen. Ye are the temple. Amen. Of the living God. As God has said, I'll walk in them. I'll live in them. And in the person of the Holy Ghost, he's living right in here. Well, why don't you talk to him? He's in there. Somebody said, this bombard him. Why do you want to do that for? <laughs> Amen. He's in there. Amen. 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 So on the inside of me, I said to him, why can't I pray for this man's healing? Why can't I say healing? He's not an old man. 66, I used to when I was 26 think it was. But when I got 66, I found it wasn't old at all. <laughs> Amen. He's not old. You promised us, you know, a long life. That's not a long life. Why can't I pray for his healing? And on the inside of me, the Lord said to me, he's 66, he's acting about 66 and a half. I've been waiting on him 36 years to judge himself and put away sin. He is born again 30 years ago. I've been waiting on him 36. Think about the mercy of God. Think about the grace of God. He said to me, he's never lived right in 36 years, over two weeks at the time. So I judged him, turned him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now he's ready to go, got everything ready, leave him alone, let him come on home. But one thing you can do, say to him that I told you to tell him, you're going to lay your hand on him and he'll be filled with the Holy Ghost and his last days will be better than his first. So then I stopped praying the prayer I'd been praying with my mind and got my tongue hooked up to my spirit again, laid my hand on his head and said, Mr. So-and-so, 
The Lord told me to lay my hand on you and you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost and your last days will be better than your first. And there in bed, he lifted both hands and immediately started speaking in other tongues. Never stammered, never stuttered. I left him sitting up in bed talking in tongues. I went down the road singing grace and I can't sing. I couldn't carry a tune, you know, in a sack or in a bucket with a lid on it. Amen. But I'm so overwhelmed I went down the road singing grace, grace, God's grace, grace that's greater than all of our sins. Amen. Weeping. I'd seen a manifestation of God's grace and we went our way. They told me later that he sat up in bed three days and nights and talked and sang in tongues and had a glorious home going. Now that wasn't even God's best, but it sure do beat going to hell. Yeah. Amen. He ought to judge himself. He ought to judge himself. Amen. But he didn't. He didn't. And so God had to. Why didn't he? He said, so that he wouldn't be condemned with the world. Amen. amen. I said, amen. amen. Praise God forevermore. Now what I'm saying to you is why faith is weak and victory is lost a lot of time. But it don't have to be with you. I propose to walk in the light. Bless God, if you miss it, don't wait. Correct yourself right then. Don't wait till you get to church. And, and if you miss it, you know it right in here. And if you don't know it in there, amen. Bless God, then you haven't missed it, so forget it. You see, if you listen to some people, everything's wrong. Amen. Amen. Everything's wrong. Now, you know what 1 John 3, 21 said? If you don't turn to it and read it, I want you to. I'm going to give you time to do it. Uh, mark this verse. If you can't write in your Bible, throw it away. Get one of ours out there. You can't write it. <laughs> Amen. Write this verse down. <laughs> Beloved, 1 John 3, 21. And he's writing to Christians and believers, you know, because he calls them in this first epistle, my little children. 1 John 2, 1. But 1 John 3, 21. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Hallelujah. You see, it isn't the Holy Ghost that condemns you when you sin or convicts you. According to Jesus, in John's gospel, he only convicts the world of one sin because they don't believe in him. That's not the Holy Ghost conviction. I'm talking about in the Christian. That's your own spirit, your heart, your own spirit that tells you, that condemns you. Because your spirit has been born again, become a new man in Christ, got the life of the nature of God in it, your spirit knows the minute you miss it. Amen? Sure. If our hearts condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Amen. You see, if you are doing wrong, you know it. You don't have to have me to tell you. Right on the inside of yourself, in your heart, in your spirit, you know it. If you don't know it, if your heart does not condemn you, then forget it. Don't try to drag up something. Walk on, bless God in the light, and be blessed. Now, if you listen to some people, they'll always have you under condemnation. Everything according to them is wrong. Somebody wrote a note in one of our crusades and, and, and put it in the offering receptacle. Amen. And here's what the note said. This, talking about this meeting, this crusade is not of God. God isn't using you, talking about the entire crusade team, because you wear jewelry. <laughs> and your women don't have long hair. It would be fun if it wasn't so pathetic. <laughs> Do not allow yourself to come under condemnation because of everybody's idea. It will keep your faith from working. It'll bring you into defeat. Amen. Amen. I remember in one of our meetings, I'd laid hands on a woman, prayed with her. She had been filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. She'd been speaking in other tongues for about 15 minutes. She was having a great time. Well, she had been kneeling in the altar. She stopped, got up, sat down on the altar bench, still talking in tongues. She is sitting there with her hands raised, speaking in other tongues in this church meeting many years ago. Be, to be exact about it, I knew you'd want to know, January of 1939. <laughs> so I saw this man coming. My spirit alerted me. I, I, I knew he's up to no good. Say, so how'd you know? I don't know, just an inward perception. And so I, I'd walked away from him. I saw him come in. I walked that way. Got there about the time he did. She, she's got her hands up praising God. He could see she had on a gold wedding band. 
He said, sister, take that wedding band off and God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. I got a hold of both of his hands because he'd put on her and turned him around and escorted him the other way and said, brother, God's already baptized with the Holy Ghost, wedding band and all. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I said, amen. 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 Now, you see, the Bible talks about sin but it also talks about weights. You remember Hebrews 12, 1? Wherefore, 12th chapter, first verse, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Two different things. And the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Now, sin, the Bible said, what is sin? Not a lot of these little old things people say. Notice what 1 John 3, 4 said sin is. 1 Epistle John, the third chapter, fourth verse. Note it. Sin is a transgression of the law. Well, where did you ever read where the Bible said the law said it's a sin to wear a ring? God don't make a any difference. Well, you got a ring on your finger or your toe. <laughs> Amen. It's not going to keep you out of the blessings of God. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4 says. Now, he not only talks about laying aside sin, but he said every way. We will have to determine in our own heart the things that are weights to us, things that hinder us, hold us back in our Christian life. Amen? Amen. Now, what might be a weight to me might not be a weight to you at all. Amen? But we will, if we're really going to run the race, that he set before us, we will need to lay aside those things if we're going to run with patience the race that's set before us. Amen. Amen. Now, in talking about weights, I'm still not talking about trying to do what everybody says. You try to do what everybody says, it'll just keep you jumping. Amen. Amen. If you let it, people on every side will bring you under condemnation, try to condemn you at least, and if you listen to them, we'll condemn you and they'll keep your faith from, from working. Amen. Amen. But I'm talking about what your own spirit tells you. If you're a child of God in your own spirit, in your own heart, right down on the inside of you, you know the minute that you missed it. You know it. Well, like I said, don't wait. Don't even wait till you come back to church again. Just stop right there and say, Lord, I missed it. I fail, forgive me, and he'll do it. I said, he'll do it. Because he said, if we judge yourself, we'll not be judged. Thank God we'll not be judged. I said, thank God we'll not be judged. I said, thank God we'll not be judged. Because we judged yourself and said that was wrong. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God both now and forevermore. Amen. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So then, understand this. Be sure that the promises of God, the scriptures, cover the things you are believing for. Therefore, you should have no doubt about it. Now, remember the text said, and shall not doubt in his heart. Have no doubt about it. If it's in God's word, it belongs to you. But as we've seen, Satan is the God of this world. And many of the things that you pray for and endeavor to believe God for and the promises of God cover, they have to come to pass in this world where Satan is God. The money you're endeavoring to believe for is not up in heaven. They don't have any American dollars or any other kind of money or currency up there from Japan or Germany or anywhere. The money you want down here, you need's down here. Yeah. Did you ever notice that Satan fights you more about money than he does anything else? Because yeah. he has a greater opportunity to control that than he does anything else because he's the God of this world. He's the God of this world. Well, that doesn't mean that God didn't hear you just because you prayed. See, a lot of times people pray but you see, the, 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 the devil and evil spirits, as we read about earlier, are working to try to keep that from coming to pass. 
And just because you prayed and it hadn't come to pass doesn't mean the answer is not on the way. Now here's a good example. Go back to the book of Daniel. And we'll not have not time to read. I'm just going to rehearse it for it. You get back over there in the 10th chapter of Daniel. Daniel set himself to seek God. He fasted. Now he wasn't on a total fast. The scripture said that he ate no pleasant bread. He ate no pleasant bread. Why? Because that fasting also for 21 days. Then God sent an angel with the answer. But the angel was 21 days in getting there. But notice what he said in Daniel 10, 12 now. Notice what the angel said to Daniel. For from the first day, everybody say first day. The first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Now notice, God did not send the answer the 21st day. He sent the answer the first day. Well, what happened? The angel told Daniel, look at verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. That's 21 days, isn't it? The prince of Persia did not want the angel to get through with the answer. Well, you remember the text we read there in Ephesians. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Amen, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, all of those three divisions of satanic activity are dealing with this world. Then he said, and spiritual wickedness, King James said, in the heavens. The margin said, wicked spirits in the heavens. And this prince of Persia is one of those wicked spirits up there. Amen. In the heavens. And, and, and so he, he, he endeavored to keep him from getting through. Well, God answered it the first day. Now note, you remember we read the scripture the first night service here of this seminar? Satan said to Jesus, remember in Luke the fourth chapter, at the temptation, when he took up on the high mountain, he showed him all the kingdoms in the world in a moment of time. The Bible said it was a temptation, so it's a real temptation. Notice there in Luke 4, 6, remember what the devil said? All this power, see he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, all this power, that word translated power there in the Greek can also be translated authority. All of this authority, in other words, the authority of the kingdoms of this world will I give thee, and the glory, the glory of the kingdoms of the world will I give thee. Now notice, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now that's either a truth or a lie, one of the two. Amen. Amen. It wouldn't be a temptation. Jesus is son of God. He didn't know it wasn't right. But he never disputed it at all. Well, now, who gave that to, to Satan? Adam did. Adam was the God of this world to begin with. He gave it over into his hand. Well, the prince of Persia then well, was over in the spirit world where evil spirits were ruling that nation of Persia, which is our modern Iran. Notice they're still ruling it. Those spirits did not want the angel to get through with the answer. God heard Daniel the first day. God sent the answer the first day. God sent the answer when you prayed. He said, call unto me and I'll answer you. It may not have materialized yet, but he sent the answer when you prayed. Many people, if the answer doesn't materialize just right away, drop back in unbelief and doubt and say, well, maybe it wasn't the will of God anyway. If you've had scriptures that says it's yours, it's the will of God. Amen. I said, amen. amen. I know several years ago, one lady, her little child was actually, what she had, she had polio. She got into the charismatic circles. She took this child to different ones to be prayed for. And finally she said, it's just not God's will to heal my little girl. I took her, mentioned this place, and I took her to that healing evangelist, and I took her to that healing evangelist. It's not God's will because he didn't heal her. If it had been his will, he would have healed her. No, my friends, it was the will of God to heal that child. I said it was the will of God to heal that child. Such thinking violates the word of God, violates the promise of God. Healing belonged to that child. Healing belonged to that mother. But she let doubt and unbelief come in concerning the word of God. And it robbed her of the blessing that God intended that she should have. Amen. No, friends, if God said it, he intended that we should have it. He would not provide something for us 
and then put it under lock and key and not let us have it, he'd be unjust, he'd be cruel. Realize that it's not God who's withholding from you. I'm talking about where you know God's word, you've got the promise, you've got the scripture. It's a devil that's hindering you and trying to keep it from manifesting. So stand your ground. Stand your ground. Stand your ground. Be certain that no unbelief or doubt is permitted in your life concerning the word of God or the promises of God. Constantly confess and confirm that God's word is true. God's word is true, isn't it? Now, in conclusion, real quickly, I want you to turn to the 27th chapter of Acts. This has brought me through many a hard place. And I've been through a few hard places in these last 55, 66 years. This April, this coming April, I'm in April now, this coming the 22nd day of April, I'll be 56 years old. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In the Lord. Amen. I like something that Paul said. On board, you know, that tempest-tossed ship. Now, if they had listened to him, they would not have gotten into trouble to begin with. Because when he boarded that ship, look at Acts 27, 10. He said, sirs, I perceive, didn't say God told him, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading, that's the merchandise, and ship, but also of our lives. See, Paul didn't say the Lord told me. I have a revelation. He said, I perceive. He just had that perception in his spirit. We've all had that in our spirits. Too many times we didn't listen to it and got us in trouble. Amen? I said amen. amen. Sometimes I did. I'm just as human as you are. I didn't pay attention to that inward perception like I should. Thank God he had mercy on me and forgive me. Thank God for his grace. But what did they do here? They lost the ship. They lost the merchandise. They would have lost their lives. But Paul said, look at the 22nd through the 25th verse of the same open 27th chapter of Acts now. Notice, Paul said, be of good cheer. Oh, thank God. I mean, how are you going to be of good cheer? The ship going down. They're all going to be a loss. God never comes with any other message but a message of good cheer. Amen. 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 He never comes with a message of fear and fright. Amen. And night. He comes with a message of cheer and light. Glory to God. Be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Now why? There stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Now listen. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul made three positive statements that has been mine for years and blesses me even yet. Number one, he said, I belong to God. That's a good thing to know, isn't it? He was in the midst of danger, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of trial. In the midst of it looked like impending death. But he did not forget that he belonged to God. He said, the angel of the God whose I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's saying I belong to God. I belong to God. To whom do you belong? Amen. Amen. Number two, he said, I serve God. Somebody said, I'm trying to. No, you're not to try to, you're to do it. I serve God. Then he said, number three, I believe God. Paul said, I believe God. Believe what about God? I believe that it shall be even as it was told me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what I believe about God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Oh, but somebody said, an angel appeared to Paul. I know it. The Bible, the Word of God tells us that we have a more sure and steadfast Word in the book, the Bible, than in the Word of an angel. Whoa, glory to God. Glory to God. That statement, 
These statements in particular, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me has brought me through many a hard place. And I've been through many one of them. Amen. Amen. I simply stood my ground. Remember what the scripture said, we read it, having done all to stand, stand. Stand, stand. I just simply stood my ground and said, sirs, I'm talking to the devil. Anybody else that'll listen. (laughs) Sirs, I belong to God. I serve God and I believe God. I believe God that it shall be even, and I'd hold up the book sometimes, even it was told me in this book. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've stood there when the wind was whistling around, when the lightning is flashing and the thunders are rolling, when the dark clouds had gathered, when the devil said it's all up, you might as well quit and give up. You're done for, throw the sponge in the ring, quit. But blessed be God, I stood there and said I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. And one time in a great test, in a great trial, when the devil said it won't work, you're going down. I literally off by myself, nobody saw me. I got my Bible and put it on the floor and stood on it like this and said, Mr. Devil, I want you to hear me. If I go down because the word of God went down on me, I'm standing on it. If I go down, me and Jesus will go down together because I'm holding on to him. Amen. But he can't go down. He can't go down. He can't go down. Hallelujah. 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 Kenneth Hagen Ministries reaches out to take the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world with books, audio and video cassettes, radio, television, and the Word of Faith magazine. Each month, Kenneth Hagen Ministries publishes this free 24-page teaching magazine. The Word of Faith offers a variety of practical teachings from the Word of God, exciting news from Kenneth Hagen Ministries, and feature articles about how this ministry is affecting the lives of people like you. You'll also find a complete listing of the ministry's international radio program, Faith Seminar of the Air. On Faith Seminar of the Air, Rev. Kenneth E. Hagen brings solid scriptural teaching to encourage you in your daily walk with God. The Word of Faith magazine also contains an up-to-date listing of the All Faith Crusades in your area. The impact of Rev. Hagen's ministry is powerfully displayed through these All Faith Crusades, which are conducted across the United States with Rev. Kenneth E. Hagen, his crusade team, and the Rama Singers and Band. The printed page is a far-reaching means of spreading the gospel. Currently, more than 36 million faith library books are in distribution in 25 foreign languages and dialects. In addition, approximately a half a million messages on cassette tapes are sent each year throughout the world. The teaching from God's Word and faith library books and tapes will bless and transform your life just as it has blessed and transformed the lives of countless people around the world. If you would like to receive more information about Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Ramo Bible Training Center, or if you would like to receive our free monthly magazine, The Word of Faith, please write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 7415012.